Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Church of the Open Bible, 12 Washington Boulevard, Kingston 20, Jamaica, West Indies. Another beautiful, bright day it has been so far here in Kingston City, and we are here back for our continuation in the series of Bible studies of the book of Jonah. We trust that you have been blessed so far and that this evening we have a wonderful little program lined up for us as always we are going to have our praise team sister bailey and thompson and company doing our praise and worship for us then they are going to be followed by our intercessory prayer by our deaconess monica sims and then we're going to have an item by the duet bailey and thompson and then we're going to get into the word and I want to be praying and I want you if possible to read ahead and we are doing a chapter 3 this evening and we thank God for the privilege of coming together in his house for a time uh, to look into his words and be blessed tremendously we welcome you all we thank God for you and we pray a blessing over you shall we bow our heads as we sing our little song and get going as the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. rejoice to be in your house one more time with your people to worship and magnify your holy name it is such a blessing and a privilege lord to be able to look into your words together asking your holy spirit's guidance and anointing upon your words and upon us and all those who may be viewing us oh god by way of the world wide web Father, we pray, O oh God, that your words, which are lamp and light to our feet and path, will go forth this evening with power and clarity, effecting in our hearts, O oh God, strength and encouragement to trust you more. And for those who don't know you as Lord and Savior, that they, O oh God, will surrender to your nudging this evening of your Holy Spirit 
to make a commitment of their lives to you, which is the greatest decision any human being can make. Father, bless our time together, we pray. Anoint every soul involved in this little program. Bless Church of the Open Bible, O oh God, right across the world, wherever we are, as your people are. Bless your people, we pray, in Jesus' name, with grateful hearts, telling you thanks for all things at all times. In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Praise team. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we exalt you. You are God of all gods. We thank you, mighty God, for there is none like you. We worship you because you alone are worthy to worship and adore. Thank you, Lord. My young companion, fear thee well. Hallelujah. My young companion, fear thee well. I will not go with you to
we bless your name this day oh God we thank you mighty God that you are good and Lord we thank you that your mercy endureth forever Lord we thank you oh God almighty that your Holy Spirit is with here us today mighty God in the name of Jesus Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are here to do us good in the name of Jesus. We decree and we declare, O oh God, that the Lord God reigns. And your word declares, O oh God, that a fire goeth before you and burn up all your enemies. The heavens declare your righteousness. And we the people see your glory. And you, O oh Lord, are exalted over all the earth. And so as we come, mighty God, today, lifting up all the hands to you, mighty God. Lord, we want to thank you for all the things that you have brought us through. And so tonight, mighty God, in this Bible study, we thank you that your presence is here. We thank you, almighty God, that you are the one mighty God who stands at the end in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, almighty God, for your man servant, O oh God almighty, that will, mighty God, do this Bible service Today, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you anoint him from the crown of his head unto the sole of his feet in the name of Jesus. So that mighty God, as he ministers mighty God, he will do it to your honor and to your glory in the name of Jesus. Lord, and everyone that will be watching, mighty God, on live stream or otherwise, mighty God, we thank you, Lord, that there is something, mighty God, in this mighty God for each and everyone in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, mighty God, that every heart, mighty God, will be blessed in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, mighty God, that with that which we will hear. Mighty God, we thank you that we will hear one thing, but many things will be ministered to us by your spirit, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. Lord, and we praise you. Mighty God, that nothing, no one, no hindering spirit, no force 
places of darkness. Mighty God will have any place in this Bible study. In the name of Jesus. But we thank you tonight, Lord God Almighty, that you take preeminence. Take over this service. From the beginning, Lord, unto the end, you are in charge. You are in charge, O oh God. And we thank you, mighty God, in the name of Jesus. Now, as we hear your words, Lord, we thank you, Lord God Almighty, that they will sink deep on the inside. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that they will mature in us, Lord. And they will grow and they will bring forth fruit in the name of Jesus. Have your way this night, Lord. Be glorified, be exalted. Lord, be uplifted in the name of Jesus. And we give you thanks for this time, O oh God. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Maybe there are so many of you this evening that are going through your storm. But we have a Savior who is Jesus Christ. We, are, we can all anchor into that rock. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Like a ship sailing out on a trip so rough and long, so far from shore, so far from home, I said. Ship of mine, the light of my Savior will lead me safely to the night. Though my ship may be rocking on my sail, may be torn. In the eye of the storm When the wind and water rages And the billows begin to roll The blessed rock of ages Speak peace to my soul. He holds me in his arm, so safe and so warm, and I found shelter in the eye of the storm. of mine, the light of my Savior will lead me safely through the night. Though my ship may be rocking on my sail, may be torn.
shape of mine, the light of my Savior will lead me safely through the night. Though my ship may be rocking on my sail, may be torn. This is a song of hope tonight. We can rest in our Lord Jesus, who is the rock. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of our God, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. We want to express our thanks to you for joining with us this evening in our Bible study time, looking into the word of the Lord. And we truly have been blessed for the last two weeks that we have been soldiering on in the book of Jonah, this little book that is so amazing. It has so many nuggets of truth, exquisite stuff for our life with the Lord as we soldier on and we walk with the Lord in the light of his words. This evening we are going, we stated that we have four messages that we want to bring out of this book, four messages to Israel. And we have gone to so far. We are going into chapter three this evening. But before we get into chapter three, I want to give you, just bring back to your a little recap, so to speak, about some of the nuggets or thoughts that we could bear in mind going forward in our relationship with the Lord as exposed out of the book of Jonah by the Spirit of the Lord to us. But before we get into that, let's breathe a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your awesomeness. We thank you that we can have the confidence that you are in total control. No matter what storm clouds may rock this ship of mine, the light of my Savior will lead me safely through the night, as done so wonderfully by our duet a while ago. Lord, such an encouraging song, words of comfort, words of cheer to our hearts. We pray, God, that you will bless our hearts as we look into your words one more time to refresh our souls, to encourage our hearts in going forward with you. And we tell you thanks, O oh God, for your words which are lamp and light and life, Lord, pertaining to life and godliness as stated in the book of Second Peter. Your words and knowledge of you pertains to life, all things pertaining to life and godliness. So be with us. We pray as we give you thanks by faith for all things at all times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let me tell you the two messages that we have done so far. And the first message is God's message to Israel about his concern for Gentile peoples. The Lord's love for the souls of all people was supposed to be mediated through Israel, God's elect and covenant nation. Through Israel, the blessing of his compassion was to be preached to the nations. The book of Jonah was a reminder to Israel of her missionary purpose. And we saw that beginning with verse 1, where it stated that the word of the Lord came to Jonah that he should go to this great city, Nineveh, and preach to them, warning them of the coming destruction as judgment because of their sinful, wicked, cruel ways. Secondly, we took a look 
last week, where the second message to Israel was, the book demonstrates the sovereignty of God in accomplishing his purposes. Though Israel was unfaithful in its missionary task, God was faithful in causing his love to be proclaimed in praise to God for miraculously delivering him. Jonah confessed, salvation comes from the Lord. Jonah 2 verse 9. Israel failed to proclaim God's mercies, but his work gets done in spite of human weakness and imperfectness. Praise the name of the Lord. This evening, our third message is in chapter 3. And it also has a part, it makes reference to a part of chapter 1. But I'm just giving you a whetting of the appetite. Let me read the passage that we'll be looking into in a little while in depth. And it reads, chapter 3 from verse 1 says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Make a note of that. We are coming back to it. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every man from his evil way. And from the violence that is in their hands. Make a note of that as well. That was verse 8. Who can tell if God will turn and repent. And turn away from his fierce anger. That we perish not. Tent and last. And God saw their works. That they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil. That he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Thank God for Jesus. This is the word of the Lord and we honor it by saying, thanks be to God. As I promised, we are going to do a little recap. Just a few nuggets and I trust that you would have a little paper or pen or pencil that you could jot down a few of these things which I consider pertinent to our lives. And this is just a little recap of the first two verses. Now, if you remember the little introduction for the purpose of those who may be joining us for the first time, we dealt with, we broke it down to, the two major people that are in this book and the two major places. We spoke of God being the main personality in this book, not Jonah, which many people think. We spoke of God having the last the first word and the last word, and then doing several miracles, showing his might, sovereignty, and power to accomplish what he has asked us and told us to do. We also looked at Jonah, the only prophet in the Old Testament to try and run away from an assignment from God Almighty. We looked at Jesus in the New Testament, made reference to the book of Jonah as um, authenticating it as a real book of the Bible, not just a parable or a story that was told, but it really did happen. Jesus made mention of it several times in his ministry. Then we looked at the places. We looked at Israel. 
and we saw that Israel was at its most economically sound state. It was prosperous. It was doing well. It had recaptured under King Jeroboam II's reign. It had retaken some of the cities taken by Assyria because Assyria at the time was experiencing some amount of internal disruption and dissension which caused it to weaken. So Jeroboam II had a good opportunity to reclaim some of their captive countries. So Israel was doing materially well, but at the same time, they were doing their absolute worst, spiritually and morally. Isn't it funny that sometimes we mention that when we are doing all right financially, that we don't regard God as we ought. We get complacent in our abilities and we should remember that it is God according to the book of Deuteronomy, I think verse uh, chapter 7 or 8 somewhere there where it speaks to God being the one who gives man the ability to gain wealth. So we are not to forget that and knowing that even the very breath in our nostrils belong to God. It's a gift from God. This life is a gift from God. So we are to acknowledge God in all our ways and not to lean on our own understanding according to the book of Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 and we ought to talk about God in everything we do and he shall direct our path praise the Lord we want to thank God for that all right so now that was Israel so while they were in that state of moral and spiritual decadence decay God sent two prophets, which were, who were Jonah's contemporaries, meaning they were preaching at the same time Jonah was around and being sent to Nineveh. They proclaimed to Israel that judgment is coming if they don't repent. They were there, remember, the prophet Hosea and the prophet Amos. They prophesied at the time that God would punish them using his instrument of punishment was going to be the Assyrians. They would take them captive. Amos spoke to the fact that Israel would be taken captive north of Damascus, which is in the general direction of Nineveh. And then Hosea was a bit more pointed when he spoke to the fact that Assyria would rule over Israel. So they knew that Jonah knew and I'm bringing this together for us. Jonah knew that Assyria, Nineveh, which was about to be the capital, is one of those cities that was considered the mightiest among the Assyrian townships. That Nineveh was their like army capital. This is where their exploits took place. They came out of Nineveh, their army, so to speak. All right. So Jonah was fully aware of the word of the Lord warning Israel that if they didn't repent that Assyria would be used to punish them. And now let us look at Assyria, the second major place. And beloved, let me tell you something. The city of Nineveh became the capital of Assyria after a little after Jonah's time, which was about 759 BC. But let me tell you this. Assyria was a wicked, idolatrous country. They would boast of the cruelties that they would inflict upon their captives. My word, they were cruel. They would burn the people, cut off parts. They would skin them alive. They would do some atrocities to the people and they would brag about it. Assyria was powerful. They were mighty and they were like without feeling for anybody else. A very arrogant set of people. Because if you remember, when Sennacherib came against um, Hezekiah, Yes, thank God for Jesus. When he came against him, you know, with his troop, and he started to mouth off to King Hezekiah and the people of Israel to tell them, listen, don't let your king fool you and tell you that your God can deliver you. Because what I'm told all the other people that we overthrew as we are coming towards you, where were their gods? And they couldn't save them, and neither can your God save you. And when the people of Israel cried, and King Hezekiah cried, to the Lord God, he sent a word through his prophet, Isaiah. And he said to them, don't worry. This man here, Sennacherib, will not shoot an arrow into this place. He will not come into this city. 
And the Lord sent the same night one angel. And he wiped out 185,000 soldiers in Sennacherib's army. All dead corpses in the morning when he got up. And he took himself away, went back to his town in Nineveh. Went into his temple to serve his uh, idol god Nishrak. And his two sons snuck in and killed him and took off somewhere else. So he died in short order. You see how our God can take care of business. One angel, you know. I remember the song. He could have called 10,000 angels our Savior when he hung on that cross. But he died alone for you and for me. So don't worry, people of God. Our God is almighty. Our God is sovereign. And even over this COVID-19, our God is totally in control. So there's no need for you to fret. This is not the first challenge that we are facing. Maybe it's the first of this kind where it is a pandemic worldwide. And I have heard and read that these things happen every couple of hundred years or so. The earth experiences this sort of disaster, catastrophic proportions we experience but our God is able all right so that is it for the introduction for those who are with us to give you a little foundation of what we have been looking into let's get into the nuggets now in chapter one the first nugget is God's words to us contains everything for life and godliness According to Second Peter, <coughs> praise God. As salvation, that is salvation of the lost. Therefore, we ought to submit to God in obedience and be doers and not only hearers of the word of his words. Luke 6, Luke 6 and verse 46 to 49 tells us that the person who does not only hear the word but does the word of God submits in obedience to doing God's words he says he's like the man who digs a deep foundation and uh, builds on the rock and when the storms and the winds blew against it it stood the test of time but the man who hears the words only and doesn't do them is like the man who builds his house on a sandy foundation and when the winds blew and the rain beat against it it fell and the fall of it was great so beloved here is something very important you need to know God's words should be the most important words that you will ever read or hear and you need to submit to God and be obedient in doing what God tells you to do. Secondly, disobedience or running from God's words is very exhausting and distressing. Example, Jonah. Jonah, when he tried to get away from God's assignment, God's words came to him. Go to Nineveh, which is northeast of Samaria. He took off west to go to Tarshish. So he went down to Joppa and found a boat going to Tarshish and went down into the boat. And I made mention of the fact that if you notice the first couple of verses in Jonah, is that when you run from God, your life takes a downward spiral. He went down to Joppa, found a boat going down to Tarshish and paid the fear and went down into the boat. And when he went down into the boat, he fell asleep. You remember I mentioned also Elijah when he did such a mighty exploit for God on Mount Carmel and God showed up so mightily on his behalf and he slew the 400 Baal prophets and then he even outran Ahab the king's chariot back to Jezreel outran them you know and several miles you know he outran them he was on foot and he outran the horses and you know kings in those days have the best horses and let me tell you something Jezebel Ahab's wife sent one word of threatening to Elijah and the man of God who just experienced the power of God that sent down fire from heaven because of his prayer and licked up the altar licked up the sacrifice licked up the water evil, the stones, everything God's power took care of. The man took off because of fear. 
from one threat from an angry woman. Let me tell you something. When you run from God, you get the wrong perspective. You remember what Elijah said when the angel came to him? What are you doing here? He said, look here now, no? The people have turned against God and they have slew all of God's prophets. And only I am left and they are seeking my life. When God sorted this thing out for Elijah when he was in the cave. And God showed up and showed him the display of his power one more time. But then spoke to him in the still small voice in the wind. He came out and God saw out the thing. God said to him, listen up. You go back the same way. And you anoint. And he gave him the three persons that he should anoint to take care of business. On God's behalf and for God's people. And he said, you see that woman Jezebel, don't worry about Jezebel. The dogs are going to eat her against the wall of Jezreel. And he said, you see that thing you're saying that you are the only one left. I have preserved 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee to Baal. So you see the wrongness of our thoughts and perspective when we run from God out of fear for our life, losing our life, which don't belong to us in the first place. It belongs to God. This is why I'm trying to tell you now, you know, don't be afraid. Don't let anything shake your faith. Trust in the Lord Almighty and he will direct your path. You don't have to worry. Nothing can happen to the people of God. Here I'm scared. I'm. Nothing happens to us by chance. And sometimes, you know, believers, I hear us pray, you know. And, you know, I am praying for us. That when we pray, we pray with a level of understanding. We ask the Holy Spirit to help us to pray. We are praying for our sick brothers and sisters. And sometimes we are saying, God, we are asking, you know, or we are decreeing and declaring that you take control over the situation. What are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that God was not in control? It was the enemy that was in control of our brother and sister's well-being until you pray now? That is not correct. You're backing the wrong team. Sometimes you have to stop and think. God is always in control. He's always. So what we need to do is say, God, we know you're in control. Grant the grace, oh God, that we will not make demands of you. We will ask humbly, God, that according to your will, that you intervene more in this situation. You're not obligated, God, to telling us what you're going to do. But we thank you because we trust you and we know you are in control. And this is what we need to pray. We don't need to fear or panic. We need to acknowledge God's sovereign control over everything as is listed in the book of Jonah. May I suggest to us, you remember Elijah ran away when he got afraid and found a juniper tree and fell asleep under the tree. Kind of familiar like Jonah went down into the ship and fell asleep. And fell asleep to the point where the Bible emphasized the deepness of the man's sleep. When he said he was fast asleep, not just sleeping. So till when all the billows and storms was going on, Jonah was not even awakened by that. Imagine sailors are throwing things overboard. The ship is being rocked to and fro by the strength of the wind. Because God, when God do anything, you know, God is a God of abundance and power, you know. And when he shows up, he shows up to get something done. He wants to get our attention. And what we need to do is humbly submit to God's way and God's will and tell him thanks. Even when we don't understand it, even when it is painful, we need to have that level of trust and faith in our God that we can say, God, I don't understand it painful, but thank you anyhow. Hallelujah anyhow. Praise the name of God. And then we are speaking about God's sovereignty in being in control of everything to effect his purpose and expose our wrongs when we become complacent in running from God or rebelling against God. And we spoke about the two examples and we also made mention of David and Bathsheba. And we spoke how David sinned terribly against God and he caused Uriah's death. And he took the man's wife when it wouldn't work out in his favor to give the man a jacket. And what do I mean for our foreign viewers is that he got the man's wife pregnant and then wanted the man wanted to put off his child on Uriah by getting Uriah to sleep with his wife tonight. But the man, the honorable soldier said, no, I can't sleep contentedly with my wife in ease and comfort and my men are out there in the dirt sleeping, defending the kingdom. No, I can't do that. So the man sleep out in the yard. David was upset about that, tried his best. To pass on that to the man. But God wouldn't have it that way. And then God sent the prophet Nathan. To confront David. Same thing he did on the ship. The lot that the sailors threw. Which was a custom of that time. 
fell on Jonah. And that was God's doing as well. So he had to confess. Fourthly, we looked at choices always are accompanied by consequences. Brethren, when he had to confess to them that, look here now, this trouble is upon you because of me. And they said, what shall we do so that the sea will be calm unto us? He said, what you need to do is pick me up and throw me overboard. Now listen, when Jonah did that, you know, it may not only have been for the sailors benefit, you know, he may have also been thinking in his warped little mind, limitedness, that if they throw him overboard, he will drown in this turbulent water and he will actually get out of going to Nineveh. But you see, when we are trying to twist God's arm to get what we want, God always have the last say, you know. And God provided a fish. Can you imagine how shocked and surprised if that was his thought? Can you imagine how surprised Jonah was to be swallowed by the fish and find out that he was not dead? And he was now trapped in the belly of this fish. Well, he was now thinking anyway, at least while he was in there. Because chapter 2 speaks to the prayer that he prayed while he was in the fish's belly. Thinking that this, these were his last moments alive. But God had another plan. Let me tell you, God is so gracious, slow to anger. He's merciful, not willing that any should perish. That he causes us, brethren... To come to our senses. He gives us the opportunity to come to our senses. Be in a place where he can get our full attention. Sometimes, let me tell you, some of us, God have to stretch us out and have flat on our backs in the hospital bed. And all we can move is our eyes. Not even our lips can move. They have to feed us through tubes and other areas intravenously. But then our brains are working. Did you know that our brain under normal circumstances, is the last place to die. Preventing you being shot in the head. The last place to die on your body is your brain. You start to die from the feet up. That is why you fall down when you're going to die. You drop. There's no escaping. There's no running away. Yeah, I just want you to think about that. Let me tell you a little something about trying. Jonah, I had mentioned it first, that Jonah was aware that Assyria, Nineveh, may have played a crucial part in disciplining God's wayward people, Israel. So he thought that if he went and preached as God sent him to and he obeyed and went and the people repented, God would forgive them and keep them alive and don't destroy them. He was hoping that God would destroy them so that they wouldn't destroy Israel. So you would think that the man had a good reason. You know, Abraham and Sarah had a thought like that, you know. They thought, when God said to them, I'm going to give you a son, they thought God may have forgotten our age. And they thought that they would help God out by Sarah now taking up one of the customs of the day, not having the full trust in God, that God can do, he delights in doing the impossible in our lives. She took up a custom and decided to help God out. And you see the trouble we are in with the Middle Eastern folks these days? That son of Ishmael who is a wild man live out in the desert? And you see how much trouble we are having? All right. When we decide to help God out, we get ourselves in no ends of distress and trouble. I want to interject a personal little testimony here. I remember, I just want to share this with you briefly, about running from God. We as a family were in need of a car. And we wanted to change our car to a possibly newer one. Because the car had served us faithfully and now it was going down. Can't manage the distance that we live anymore and so on. And I asked and we prayed together for God to provide for us as usual. And beloved, my neighbor had a van that crashed and the whole of the front of the van tear off. And the van was parked on the sidewalk outside of his house. And bush was growing up around the van. The tires were deflated. And what was left of the front that was torn off was put into some boxes and pans and placed in the back of the car. And let me tell you, the sun beat on that car night, day after day after day. And I remember asking God for, uh, to help us get a car. And when we're passing the car, I heard the voice of the Lord said to me, Leon, this is what I have for you. Hear me now when I look at the car. <laughs> Hear me. No, thank you, Lord. I think I can do a little better. So I bought a Sunday cleaner, me and my son. Head off. We take off a few 
um, interesting looking ones. And we went across the town and greater Portmore looking at these cars. Brethren, I was so disappointed and disheartened when I saw, because I have a knowledge of old vehicles, you know. And let me tell you something. When I saw the man, them take up these old vehicles and dab a little paint over it and asking top dollar for it. What was little more than a shell. I was so upset. I came back home with a headache. When I passed in the van to go to my gate, I hear the voice of the Lord say, Leon, I said, this is what I have for you. I, in frustration now, hear me now. No? All right, Lord, I give up. I surrender. All right, Lord, as you would have it, Lord. Your will, not mine. You see, as I said at Believers, I could even drive through my gate before my neighbor came out and said to me, Leon, you want to care for buy? <laughs> Lord, help me, Jesus. I decided to tell the man yes because I said yes to the Lord. Getting a second chance like Jonah. And beloved, let me cut a long story short and tell you this. Within seven days, the van was completely overhauled, and we never have to buy not one piece apart. Every piece apart was in there. And God anointed the body man who put it back together. He anointed the spray man who put on the collar. And let me tell you, when I drove the van, everybody thought it was a brand new vehicle. And to the day I sold that van, the van was a blessing and it was used in the ministry of the church to carry the beloved deaconesses them to go pray for the sick and the shut in. I tell you, the Lord's hand was upon that vehicle. You see, you don't know what God has in store, but he always has the best plan. You need to surrender to the hand of God. Let me run along. I'm getting excited because this book is so amazing to our lives. Five, the futility of man's effort to impose their will upon God, even though they may mean well. That is, the sailors, they didn't want to throw Jonah overboard. So they decided to row hard, bring the board to shore, the boat to shore. But what happened? The breeze picked up strength. And they found that their efforts were futile. And then now, hear this, they prayed to God. They ask God for mercy lest they are casting an innocent man overboard. They don't want his blood on them. But they realize within short order that he wasn't innocent. Because when they threw him overboard, the sea became calm instantaneously, showing God's might and power. So when they recognize that his God is the true and living God, they made vows to God. They made sacrifices and vows. That means the man accept. Now you know how far that went spread now among the heathen, the Gentiles. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Our God, in his all comprehensive nature, can bring good out of evil. The salvation of the lost sailors. That is number six. Seven, even when we deserve God's judgment, he is merciful and gracious. And not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When they threw John overboard, God still rescued him and sent a fish to save him from drowning. And let me tell you this. This blessing of the fish, we are going to look into it, you know. It's not only. It is not only for rescuing Jonah from drowning that this fish is there in the story for I was so amazed when I thought about the situation, about this fish. Chapter 2 basically is Jonah's prayer from the inside, which we spoke about. I just want to bring something to your recollection. Jonah didn't pray for deliverance, you know. His prayer was actually a psalm of praise and thanksgiving for his life. Because remember now, it was prayed in the fish, but it was written outside of the fish. So he realized that God gave him a second chance. There are no petitions in Jonah's prayer. He described within the first several verses that his situation, his circumstances, possibly he's thinking these are his last moments. So he described that. And then it came to the point where he confessed his folly. And he said that those who follow idols forsake their own mercy. And then when he confessed to God that he's going to yet speak to God in his temple, he's going to pay his vows. He's going to now, in other words, obey the voice of God if he gets another chance. And he declares and confesses that salvation is only from the Lord. The Lord speaks. 
speaks to the fish, and the fish throws up to remember now he was in there for three days and three nights. Let us now look into chapter 3 that we just read. And among the first things we want to think of in verse 1 to 3 is God's relentless pursuing of his people in giving second chances and even third and fourth and fifth and so on for our betterment in learning to submit to God in obedience. How many of us have messed up and we thank God that he gives second chances. Isn't God just amazing and his love just overwhelming People of God, let me tell you something, man. If you only knew the blessing that salvation brings, you would never stay away. If you only saw the table spread with lovely things, you would come to the feast today. For the door is open wide and the Savior bids you come. There is nothing you have to pay. Be wise and step inside and do not be left out. Oh, praise the name of God for his wonderful invitation in Matthew 11, verse 28. There are both at the end of that verse. We want to bless God for that. Verse 4. God's miraculous power in using, here we are now at the fish, in using the great fish not only to save Jonah from drowning and also placing him in a place of solitude for reflection and repentance, but also transportation towards Nineveh. Watch this. Nineveh was approximately 550 miles northeast of Samaria, which would have taken the prophet one month to cover traveling 15 to 20 miles per day. Between verse 10, however, of chapter 2 and verse 4 of chapter 3, no mention is made of the distance or the length of time it took. The Bible just went into, and Jonah went into Nineveh one day, started to preach. Now, seeing that we are talking about God's sovereignty and his awesome power in having miracles displayed to getting his way with us, to get us to submit, I would prefer to continue thinking that the fish actually covered a good distance of the journey for Jonah. Remember, you know, Jonah was heading in the opposite direction. You know, Jonah was going west to Tarshish when he was swallowed by the fish. And now, in chapter 3, we hear that Jonah, after the fish, throws him back up on dry land. Jonah is now on his way to Nineveh. And within a day of preaching, this is what took, takes place. So the fish was not only for saving his life, and saving his soul, but also transporting him to God's designed destination. Oh, thank God for Jesus. When you mess up, God can make things turn around that you find yourself on the right path if you are willing and you submit and you repent. It's just amazing how God's all-comprehensive nature can make things work together for good that you never thought could work out this way. How many times have we been hurt and things go wrong and in the end we said to ourselves, my God, if I knew that this is how it would work out, I would have started hopping and jumping and skipping and singing God's praises from the beginning, the first sign of trouble. You just need to read the book of Job for that and the Bible is replete with stories about God's blessings upon us if we trust him and walk in his way. Verse 5 to 7, God's mighty power in granting the Ninevites receptive hearts of contrition and humility before the Almighty God due to his warning of coming destruction. There are a couple of things I want to point out in verse 5 to 7. One, the cause of their ready submission. Have you ever thought about this? The Ninevites were powerful. The Assyrians were a powerful set of people. They were cantankerous. They were like, man, the superpower of the time. So you know what that means. They were prideful. And with pride comes arrogance. Yet, one day into the city, which would take three days' journey to cover the city. This is a city. Let me read a little something for you about this city, listen to this. Oh, God can maneuver things to get people's heart softened. Nineveh was located on the east bank of the Tigris River, 
about 550 miles from Samaria, capital of the northern kingdom. Nineveh was large and like Babylon was protected by an outer wall and an inner wall. Hear this now. The inner wall was 50 feet wide and 100 feet high. That was the inner wall, you know. Remember, there's an outer one now to capture the outer little towns and cities. Before Jonah arrived at this seemingly impregnable fortress city, Two plagues had erupted there in 765 and 759, which is just before Jonah preached. And a total eclipse of the sun occurred on June 15, 763. These were considered by the pagans signs of divine anger and may help explain why the Ninevites responded so readily to Jonah's message around 759. You see how God can arrange things when he wants to save the lost. Look here, I keep remembering Paul and Silas, how God allowed them to be arrested and flogged and thrown into prison for the salvation of the jailer and his family the same night. We need not retaliate or try to defend ourselves as much as we do. Our lives are in God's hands and God is quite able to take care of business because God has a plan, you know. We serve a purposeful God. We serve an all-knowing God who knows the beginning from the end and the middle. And he has the best plan. You have to trust Almighty God. Remember, we are everlasting beings, you know. Eternal beings, you know. So it's not only this limited little part of our existence, you know. The greater part of our existence is coming when we shall be with God himself, with Jesus in paradise. And that is what we should be looking forward to. Right now, we are filled with pain and distresses, sickness, disease, criminal elements, and just people around us. Some can thank us people, but it's a privilege to be here because God so loved the world, even though it's in sin, that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believe it. In him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is why we are now here. We are Christ's ambassador to the world. Like Israel, we need to show people the love and compassion and mercy of Jesus Christ. So that they can know that it is not what you have on the outside that affects your personality. It should be what you have on the inside, which is God's salvation and love, which causes you to smile at the storm, whether you're rich or you're poor. Oh, thank God for Jesus. What a wonderful, wonderful way of life. A better way of life. May I encourage those who are viewing, who have loved ones, tell them about Jesus, man. And smile, man. Don't be so upset all the time walking around grumpy and your face long from here so to there. So trust in the Lord, man. Smile a while. Give your face a rest, man. Nobody wants to come to any church or any sort of religion or faith that have a grumpy people. And you don't only smile when things are going on for you, when you have money in your pocket. No, man. You smile because you have Jesus in your heart. Once you have Jesus in your heart, you have everything else, you know. Because God said, choose me and my kingdom first. And all things will be added unto you. For I know what you have need of. And in fact, the people of the world, the heathens, that's what they clamor after, you know. Because that's where they think that their happiness lies. Let me soldier on quickly. So that was Nineveh for you. So God allowed two plagues to break out in those big, impenetrable city walls. Two plagues. Kill off how much? Thousand people. And then the eclipse. And they feared. Because this is divine intervention now. Divine anger. So when Jonah turned up now and said, Watch and honor, brethren, if you don't repent in 40 days, you shall be destroyed. Right away, everybody get down in sackcloth and ashes. Secondly, the affluent submitted to a nobody. You know, some people, you can't talk to them when they have two shillings. You, know, you can't even approach them. I remember once in a company that I worked for, I could even go to a certain office. When I reached there, the secretary would stop me and ask me my business and send me marching back. She called on the phone, spoke to the man behind the closed door, and he would just send, send him back to his supervisor. And then he would call the supervisor and say, don't send your staff up here to antagonize me. Can you imagine that? The next time I saw that man, that man got some years later, he had retired. And he came out of a car 
at a nice little spot, a garden area. And the man's shirt was buttoned, hip shot it, could even button his shirt properly again. This was the same arrogant fellow, you know. And then I called him, and when the man saw me, the man helped me and I shaped my man because he remembered my face. Don't remember the incident, do you know? And he said, man, good to see you, man. And I said, oh, it's good to see you too, that we are still here, man. I said, let me help you up and I'll rebutton your shirt for you. He said, what? Oh, thank you very much. You are so good to all people. And I said, oh, thank God for Jesus. These are the things. Some people look at him and say, yes, serve him right. Worse than that should take him, can remember how he treat me? No, that is not what Christians are about. We are here to show the love and the forgiveness and the tolerance of Jesus Christ. Because that is how God treats us, you know. He don't treat us as how we deserve to be treated, you know. Oh Lord, help me, Jesus. Some of us would not be here today if it had not been for the mercy and the grace of God. All right. Thirdly, the rebuke to Israel's stubbornness in not taking heed to Jonah's contemporaries, that is Hazel and Amos. And by the way, that is actually the third message of the book. The third message, let me tell you what it is. It is what we have been looking into in chapter 3. The response of the Gentiles served as a message of rebuke to God's sinful nation, Israel. The spiritual insight, remember I told you that we would make inference to chapter 1. The spiritual insight of the mariners in chapter 1, 14 to 16, and their concern for the Jewish prophet, contrasts starkly with Israel's lack of concern for the Gentile nations. Jonah's spiritual hardness illustrated and rebuked Israel's callousness. Nineveh's repentance contrasted sharply with Israel's rejection of the warnings of Jonah's contemporaries, that is Hosea and Amos. That is the third message in the book of Jonah to the people of Israel and to us. How many times sinners behave better than we do? They are more tolerant, they are more gracious, and they don't go to church. They don't walk around, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and all these things. On a Sunday or on a Saturday. But right through the course of the week while you work with them, they are gracious, they are tolerant, they are kind, they are understanding. I have met so many of them in my life. I tell them, man, you're too good for you not to accept Jesus and come to heaven with the rest of us, man. I say you need to accept Jesus because it's not by works lest any man should boast. Works and good deeds, that's nice, but it will not take you into paradise. It won't take you to heaven. You have to repent of your sins. You have to confess Jesus, man, with your mouth. You have to believe in your heart that he is the son of God and that he came and died on the cross paying your debt of sin that you can accept the gift of God which is forgiveness and eternal life and easy like that, you are on your way to glory. Verse 8 and 9, Nineveh, acknowledging their sins and repenting in confession as well and then hoping in God for mercy. And finally, brethren, God who is not willing, we'll come right back to that again, you know. God who is not, the overall theme of the book, God's love for the lost. God who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God relented after the Ninevites repented. And on that note, we close here for this evening. And next week we are looking forward to the grand conclusion of the book. And may I tell you, I believe that the Lord's blessings will continue upon us as we continue to look into this wonderful book. I want you to be encouraged, you know. All the word of God in this book is an encouragement to God's people and to the lost that you have a savior, a God who loves you and is waiting for you to come to him that he can lead your life in a better path. He can give you from within the lasting things of eternity that will help you see, have a right perspective. And for us, the Christians, we don't live and panic and fret about every breeze that's blowing because our faith is built upon the solid rock, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord continue to bless you. Let me, as always, end with an invitation to those who don't know the Lord. And this, children of God, listen to me. This is how simple you need to express the love of God in your words and your attitudes, your actions. And you just 
invite the person to say, listen, salvation is as easy as a prayer, you know. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. Let, listen, if you need the Lord, if you need to recommit your life to the Lord, he is loving and waiting patiently. Pray this prayer after me. Dear God, I realize that I am a sinner and I need your salvation. Father, please forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart, save my soul. I believe in my heart that Jesus is your son and he died for me that I can have eternal life because of your love for me. Please help me, Lord, to faithfully live for you the rest of my life. I commit my life to you now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for those. Whether they were backsliders or they are sinners, they are now born afresh into your kingdom and the angels of heaven are rejoicing over their wonderful decision. I pray, God, that heaven's benediction rests upon them. That whatever their situations are, that you will divinely intervene as always and work out your purpose in their lives. That their life now will be evidence of your goodness and your mercy. That others will be drawn to your marvelous love and salvation. Bless them, I pray. Meet the needs, O oh God, and bring them out to a good Bible-believing church that they and continue to grow in grace. Bless your people who have recommitted their lives to you. Continue to open our hearts and minds to your words. And God, may we learn to live trusting you more and praising your holy name. And Lord, be with us, we pray, as we separate one from the other, but never from your presence. And we bless your holy name for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people say, Amen. The Lord bless you. Until we meet again next week when we shall be looking at the conclusion of the whole matter. And I trust your hearts were blessed and that you will read up, read chapter 4. Read over the whole book if you like. It's a very interesting book. And the blessings of the Lord be upon you and your family. God bless you until we meet again. Amen.